Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillah so far we have uh, finished um, our discussion and analysis on the Keynesian macroeconomics. So we have we have looked into so many things um, you know um, describe uh, so many uh, situations uh, equilibrium from the Keynesian point of view. So um, today um, we're gonna look uh, into another school in macroeconomics, which is the monetarist. So um, last week we have already um, started our discussion on the monetarist, but uh, let's just do a few revisions before we move on to the next uh, topic. So firstly, I would like to um, highlight um, the four propositions uh, put forward by the monetarist. So firstly. Um, like uh, what we have um, discussed last week, um, the monetarists they believe that money, uh, money supply, have a dominant effect on the nominal income, so they will move in the same direction. So number two, they believe that in the short run, a change in money supply will have a direct impact on real variables. So basically, whenever the central bank increases money supply real output and, and the other real variables in the aggregate demand will go up. However, in, in the long run, okay, in the long run, a change in a money supply will only have uh, impact on nominal variables. So if money supply keeps on increasing in the long run, it will only increase prices, but not the real variables. And number four, finally, in opposite to the Keynesian view, uh, the monetarists believe that private sector is actually stable. So we have actually discussed um, these two proposition in detail uh, last week in our meeting. Um, so what we're gonna do um, next, okay, will be to move on um, to to to, pro to proposition number three. So we're gonna look at how the monetarists will be able to explain. Um, this link okay but before we move on I would just um, just that seems that last week um, there were uh, I, I noticed like some of you have uh, quite a I don't know it's like a surprising phase or stuff like because it seems that we just started a, a new thing so maybe it would be good if, if we do or uh, if you look back into 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 one and two okay just just briefly to, to start our brief uh, review of uh, proposition number one and two, so I would like to bring you back to the the, the base the basic of the arguments between the monetarists and the Keynesian and previously with the the classical. So they are basically their arguments uh, will will basically um, you know reduce to how um, the the impact of money on on real variables from the QTM uh, equation. So we know that from the QTM equation, M multiplied with uh, uh, 1 over K okay, is equals to PY. So as you notice, this will be the uh, money supply, uh, the money variable. And this P multiplied with Y, price multiplied with real income will give us the nominal income. So the, the differences basically, just to simplify um, the discussion, is with regard to the behavior of K. So according to the classical previously, they believe that K is constant, is stable. So if you recall back from the Fisherian um, QTM, this K is just the reciprocal of velocity, okay, or the turnover rate. How, how many times does uh, a paper money change hands? The arguments between this uh, different school of thought, between the classical, the Keynesian, and, and later on the monetarist, okay, can be summarized into how they have a different way of, of explaining the behavior of K in this equation. So according to the classical, previously they believe that this K is constant. So if you recall back uh, into the other version, the Fisherian uh, QTM, so this is equivalent, this is just the reciprocal of V, the velocity. So the classical believe that the velocity of money is actually stable, is constant. However, Keynesian, they attack that view by saying that no, this is not stable because of the three motives of holding money, if you still remember. So motive number three, okay, causes this K to be uh, variable, not, not constant because it will be negatively affected by interest rate, okay, how the, the speculative demand for money is negatively influenced by a change in interest rate. And Keynesian believe that um, 
investors, uh, they are very sensitive to changes in interest rate. Okay, so remember that should have, uh, you know, uh, uh, explain uh, the slope of the uh, LM curve. However, the monetaries when they come back later, so they kind of uh, try to defend the classical view. So what Friedman did, okay, Milton Friedman did, is that he 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 based on his argument, so he 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 expanded this this k. So basically, he looked at he tried to explain what are the factors that can affect k, and in the end, uh, uh, for as a conclusion, he believed that all those impacts are relatively small. So we can somehow simply assume that this k is is can be assumed to be constant, can be constant. So basically, the uh, demand for money is 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 not is not sensitive to changes in interest rate. And remember, how will then that you know translate into a into you know how will that affect the slope of the LM curve? So because that will then um, basically help us to uh, compare um, the policy effectiveness okay between uh, the Keynesian and the monetarist. Let's see how we can explain uh, the, the first proposition put forward by the monetaries, which says that money supply has a dominant effect on nominal income. So firstly, um, we know that, um, this from our discussion in the last class, if you still remember, that the monetaries, they expanded the, the, uh, the money demand equation. So instead of, um, recall back the QTM, the Fisherian, the, the Cambridge version, so this is uh, similar to the Cambridge version of QTM. So what the monetaries did is that they expanded, they expanded the, 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 the thing that explained it. Remember, like, basically the, the differences between the monetaries, the Keynesian, and the classical, it goes, it can, can, can be summarized kind of, you know, the, 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 the differences, how, how K behave. So according to the monetaries, um, uh, Friedman, he expanded um, K uh, by looking at what are the possible factors that can affect K. So he believed he expanded um, the interest rate instead of just looking at the interest rate from the bonds market. He he also included the interest rate of uh, on equities from holding stocks, shares of, of uh, companies, as well as the expected return from holding durable goods uh, like like house. Or, for example, if you expect that um, you know RD uh, the return from holding house is high. So in that case, you it might be better for you to, to to hold a house instead of holding money. So instead of demanding money, you you will you will you would like to demand a house. So in that case, as you demand house, you use the money to buy a house. So your demand for money will go down. So basically, all these three the 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 return or the interest rate, the expected return on these three assets, will will negatively affect money demand. And then we have the usual nominal income here, PY. So we're gonna look here um, according to the monetaries. So the, how does the, the 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 money demand equation behave? They believe that the money demand equation is stable. This is stable. This is this this will not change a lot basically. The demand for money. Now to have equilibrium in the money market, we need to to make sure that the demand for money equals to money supply. And um, you you know that money supply is an exogenous. It is a policy variable. It is being determined by the central bank. The central bank simply decide, you know, whatever amount that they want to print. Okay, so to have equilibrium, basically, money supply will have to equal to money demand. Since, according to monetaries, this equation, money demand is stable. So whenever there is a shock or, or something happening in the money market, most of the time, most of the time, it is caused by money supply. Change in money supply is the one that basically causes all these disturbance. So since money demand is stable, so let's have a look what happens when money supply changes. So for example, let's say the central bank decided to print more money, increase money supply. So what will happen in, in the money market? Because now we know that there is a disturbance to the equilibrium. So there are actually three possible situations that may arise. The first, in the first situation, whenever N goes up to, for, for, for the equilibrium to hold, the right hand side must change. Okay, the right, this thing must change. So we can, since we have, we kind of have two variables here, the, the K and the PY. So if N goes up, so we can have K goes up, but nominal income remains the same, no changes. 
So this is the first situation. Second situation, it might be that the the nominal income increases, but K remains the same. K remains constant. While in the third situation, it might be that both of them go up together. Maybe 50-50. 50% K goes up by 50%. Another half goes to the nominal income or 30-70. But whatever it is, both of them goes up. So now you should be able to see that in these three cases, in these three possible situations that we have looked at in, in, in two cases, case number two and three, nominal income change. So this shows that M, M the change in money supply have, have, can impact, can influence the nominal income. However, you know, in the first case, we could see that there is also a possibility that you know, whenever money supply goes up, nominal income will not change, but actually will affect K. It will affect K. So this is why this, these three, you know, with only this assumption, um, it, because it may, it may lead to a situation where actually nominal income doesn't change. So this is why we attribute all uh, these cases, this assumption with weak quantity theory of money. Because, um, uh, to, to support this proposition, number one, because it seems that by only imposing this assumption, um, on, in, on, only in two cases that we could see that a change in money supply will have a dominant impact on nominal income. But in the first case, it may not. Okay, so that's why we say we, 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 we call this assumption as the weak quantity theory of money. So we need, we need to add another assumption to, 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 to enable us to really support this proposition. 